This is lecture six. In this lecture, we'll be talking about one big theory, cognitive dissonance. It's rather complicated theory, so I think it's very good that we will spend an entire lecture on it. So in the first part, we will talk about what the theory is. And in the second part, I'll give you some more elaboration and applications and consequences of the theory. Um, so as human beings, and we've learned this so far in, uh, in the lectures, in the previous lectures, we like to think uh, that we are good people. We like to value ourselves and we I think we are smart and reliable. We are people with good, solid ideas, right? That's what we all like to think. But sometimes these ideas are challenged. Um, you may, for example, value honesty a lot, but then... Um, you find yourself telling someone else a lie. So you tell, for example, to your kids, I tell my kids this all the time, don't lie, don't ever lie. And then I see a colleague of mine wearing a new outfit and she asks me, so what do you think of my new dress? And I'm like, ah, beautiful. Well, I actually think otherwise. So I am behaving in a way that is not in line with my own core, uh, core value, namely honesty. Um, in the same way, you can be maybe a climate activist and then still take a private jet to a climate conference and think to yourself, well, this climate, cha climate conference was really important. And then you lift off and, you know, uh, send, uh, pollute, uh, pollute the air with uh, your private jet. So these are all um, behaviors that are not in line with your own core values. And according to cognitive dissonance theory, something happens within people um, the moment we are, our ideas are battling with our behaviors. So cognitive dissonance theory is a theory that's, uh, that's uh, um, first developed by Leon Festinger in 1957, and later a lot of other researchers continue with his work. And the main idea is that the moment we experience inconsistencies between two beliefs, so two different types of cognitions, or between cognition and behavior, and this happens more often, this will lead to an uncomfortable emotional state of being. And this state is called dissonance. Rather complicated, right? Okay, so let me give you, I'm gonna give you many examples so it will become more clear. So, uh, let's imagine you are a person with a certain belief, and then you show behavior that is not in line with that belief. The moment you realize this, you will experience dissonance. It's a very unpleasant experience. Uh, it's an emotional state of being in which you sort of doubt yourself, and it's also very bad for your self-esteem. So you value yourself less the moment you experience dissonance. So an example is, let's imagine you care about the environment, and then you take an airplane to uh, your Ibiza holiday with your friends. So the moment that people confront you with this and say, I thought you cared about the climate, and now you're taking a plane to Ibiza to party with your friends? That's a bit weird, right? Then you start experiencing dissonance. Or, I think, for anyone who smokes, you experience dissonance every time you light a cigarette, because you want to be healthy, right? We all want to be healthy, and then you still smoke also an experience of dissonance. So um, if we experience this negative state, we want to get rid of it. We don't want to experience dissonance. And we have several ways of reducing this feeling of dissonance. So there's three major ways. The first one is change your behavior. Make sure your behavior is in line with your attitude, with your core value. Stop taking planes. Stop smoking. Very straightforward. If you make your behavior in line with your attitude, then you don't experience dissonance anymore. Secondly, you can change your cognition. You can change your ideas. You can change your values. I don't care about the environment anymore. Then you can take all the planes you want, right? Or you can add new conditions. And this last option is what we oftentimes do. But let me give you an example of reducing dissonance with smoking. So if you smoke, then most straightforward way would just be to quit smoking. And I think any smoker agrees this is not as straightforward as, you, as it sounds. It will be the best option in many ways, in many regards, but it's also, for a lot of people, very difficult and sometimes even an impossible, or it feels like an impossible option. So changing your behavior is oftentimes very difficult. Then you can change your cognition. So you can say to yourself, well, smoking is actually not so bad at all. You can doubt the theories. And this is also something that politi politicians oftentimes love, love to do uh, so in order to make our worlds more, more pleasurable. And, and, for example, denying climate change is beautiful, right? It makes us feels so good, all the dissonance is removed. You can take planes, you can eat meat, who cares? Because the world is actually doing very, very good. So fake news is doing this. Fake news is, is feeding into this idea that we want to reduce dissonance and, and it helps us and it enables us to change our cognitions. 
But oftentimes, of course, the consequences are really bad for changing cognitions, because these cognitions are oftentimes quite solid. These are good ideas, these are factual evidence, and, and we just ignore it and we put it aside. So that will be change in the cognition. Finally, you can add cognitions. You can, for example, say, yes, I know smoking is bad, but smoking relaxes me. And relaxing is super good for my health. So because I'm less stressed, I'm actually more healthy. So for me, it's really important to keep on smoking because otherwise I can never relax anymore. So this third way, so sort of adding cognitions or and also the second way, changing cognitions, that's what people love to do. Because we love comfortable lives. We love, you know, fooling ourselves, rationalizing our behavior. Yeah, saying something like, yes, I smoke, but it's just because everybody around me smokes. You know, it's just my way of fitting in. If I don't smoke, I'll have to make new friends, and that's really hard. Or you say to yourself, yes, smoking is bad, but, you know, not in my family, because my grandfather is now 80 years old, and he smokes a package a day, and he's still very much alive. So for, for in my family, smoking is actually not so healthy. Uh, sorry, not so harmful. So these rationalizations is what people uh, love to do. We love to fool ourselves. And this is just one of the many explanations that the, the, the behavior that people show is actually oftentimes not logical. And we convince ourselves of, of you know, comfortable lies instead of accepting sort of unpleasant uh, truth. So this state of cognitive dissonance is something that we experience a lot. And oftentimes we don't even realize it. Actually, the state of dissonance is something we experience every time we make a major decision. So for you, you're probably a first-year student, or you just started a study uh, psychology, and um, this was a big choice for you, right? Your, your, the, the choice for what you wanted to study. And maybe last year you were still contemplating all the other options. Maybe you're thinking, well, I also might want to study philosophy, or maybe I want to be a, a math student, or maybe I want to study history. You had all these different study paths that all seemed quite appealing, and psychology was just one of them. The moment you choose psychology, this is actually quite a dangerous state because choosing one option means uh, rejecting all the other choices. And all these other choices were also very appealing. Um, logically, or luckily for us, our mind helps us out because the moment we start making a choice, then we start devaluing all the alternatives. And this is called post-decision dissonance. So the moment you started to study psychology, then the, the option psychology became more attractive to you. You saw all the benefits of studying psychology, and that really was immediately very clear that this was the best choice for you. And all the other choice options became less attractive. You start seeing many downsides of studying history or philosophy. So uh, this post-decision dissonance, this state, is something you see a lot in many, many different domains. I also, because I'm a relationship researcher, of course, uh, I also love witnessing this in people in relationships. So the moment that people are in a relationship, in a happy relationship, they often also devalue the alternative to that relationship. So, for example, they have, very, uh, they have a lot of positive illusions about the partner. They see their partner as really the most attractive person, as way more attractive than this person objectively is, or as having many you know, uh, admirable qualities, qualities that other people might not even really see or maybe don't even you know, really uh, value as much as you do. So you think your choice for your partner is the best choice because your partner is the best. And that is also an automatic way of protecting your relationship. Having positive illusions about your partner is super healthy, just as it is uh, to have positive illusions about yourself. It helps us feel you know, comfortable in that relationship. The interesting thing happens, though, once the relationship dissolves. So if there's a breakup, then you see this whole uh, scenario changing. All of a sudden, everything that you thought was very admirable of your partner, all the positive things, all the positive uh, attributes of this partner, you don't value so much anymore. All of a sudden, you experience uh, post-decisional uh, um, dissonance, uh, meaning that your partner, since you're no longer with this person, is actually not a desirable option anymore. So your, our minds work really fast and oftentimes very unconsciously, sort of helping us out, give, giving us confidence in the decision that we made. So this state of post-decision dissonance is something that, that salesmen actually also are very much aware of. Here you see this very nasty salesman. And um, so what we know is the moment that we make a decision, then our minds automatically start making that choice more acceptable and more you know, admirable and better for us in our minds. 
So what salespeople would love for you to do is make the decision for a product as soon as possible. They want to get you on board because they know the moment you say yes to a certain product, for example, a car, which this nasty salesman is trying to sell you, says, here's this beautiful car. It's a great deal. You now get a discount of 1,000 euro if you trade in your old car. So you really, this is the deal you, you have to make. You think, wow, this is a really good deal. Okay, let's do it. Let's, you know, buy that car. So you make a decision to buy a car. Then all of a sudden, the cost starts to increase. The salesman says, oh, I'm sorry, the 1,000 euro uh, discount? Yeah, that, was, that stopped yesterday. So actually, that's no longer valid. So you don't get the discount anymore. This is a tactic called lowballing or the lowball technique. So you accept one thing, you make a decision, and then all of a sudden the costs increase. And we don't, you would logically think, then you just say, oh, then I'm not interested anymore. But because your mind already made the decision to buy it or to go for it, then the, the, yeah, this, this, uh, our minds already worked so hard in order to make that, that choice a good choice that we still stick with it. We are committed to the decision the moment we make it. And um, this has also been uh, tested in uh, the domain of research. So if a researcher asks, for example, uh, a participant, would you like to um, uh, participate in my study at 7 a.m. in the morning? It's not really you know, something you would love to do, but then still 24% of the people say, Yes, okay, I'll, I'll do your study at 7 a.m. in the morning. What if you use lowballing? So then what would that look like? Then you can say something like this. You can first start by asking the question, would you like to participate in my study? Full stop. Okay, you wait for the answer. Then people say, yes, ah, yeah, I want to participate in your study. Oh, it starts at 7 a.m. in the morning. Then... 56% of the participants agree. So even though you know, it's, it's the same question, but then posed differently, you basically trap people. Once they say yes, they will stick to their choice. And yeah, you can use lowballing in order to make people consent or agree with buying a certain uh, product. Um, so the key here is that the moment we make a decision, one of the routes to resolve dissonance is blocked. That's the route of changing your behavior. So the behavior, you already show the behavior. So you're going to stick with that. Um, you then only, the only thing you, that's left for you to do is changing your cognitions. And that's sometimes really, really hard. And you see that in the following examples. Let's imagine you decided to join the army. And joining the army is a choice with many consequences because you have to go through very intense training. Of course, it depends a little bit for where you go to, go to the army, but oftentimes you have a period in which there's really intense training. It's really nasty. You don't sleep much. You have to uh, work out all the time, and it's in a very uh, uh, nasty circumstances. You have to go through the training. So you have to show behavior that is really effortful. And it's actually, logically, you would think, why would anyone on earth do this? Same thing with hazing. So let's imagine you decided to join a fraternity or maternity. Um, then what you then see is that people often go through a period in which they have to do very weird or stupid or tragic stuff. For example, these guys over here are drinking probably beer in a diaper outside somewhere. Showing this is really weird, uh, extreme behavior, and it's unpleasant, right? It's something that we really don't like to do. So our minds have to work really hard to justify this effort. If you have to go through a period of this, like haze and like joining the army, our minds is just working like crazy, trying to add cognitions in order to justify this for us. So we know that actually, ironically, Going through these periods of hazing is actually psychologically very smart because what we then see happening is after this period of showing this very effortful, nasty behavior, you start liking the army or the fraternity more. So ironically, because you, have to, you went through such an intense period, you had to do so weird, such things that were outside of your comfort zone, uh, your mind starts to justify this by saying that this is really the best uh, the best uh, workplace for me, or this is really the best fraternity in the entire world. Uh, and that's uh, actually why this is still happening. So this, we, we know from research that um, uh, fraternities where there's hazing, that then the members become really committed. They really, they, they never uh, want to leave the fraternity. They feel like uh, the fraternity is super important for their identity, much more than uh, fraternities where there's no hazing. 
So even though it's very weird, it's very silly, sometimes really dangerous uh, even, it does work because it makes people more committed. And that's what our minds do so in order to justify this, this behavior uh, to us. So here you see again an example of the way our mind is fooling with us in order to make us believe that we are rational human beings while we're actually not. So this is the basic summary of the cognitive dissonance theory.